The choir sings Psalm 142, for which we sit. First lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commands to a thousand generations, and who repays in their own person those who reject him. He does not delay, but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that I'm commanding you today. If you heed these ordinances by diligently observing them, the Lord your God will maintain with you the covenant loyalty that he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock in the land that he swore to your ancestors to give you. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus told this parable to those among the Pharisees who loved money. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and sent Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so, to, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The choir sings the anthem Like as the Heart by Herbert Howes, which sets to music the first three verses of Psalm 42.
May I speak in the name of the God of all hope and peace, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. It was the hardest Lent I have ever had to endure. Not because of the suffering of my Lenten disciplines, although of course I did those. It was hard because of the unrelenting pain of those in Gaza, suffering real hunger, not because of fasting, but because they were being starved to death. It was a hard Holy Week for us in the Diocese of Jerusalem, for all Christians. But at least the mood and the seriousness of the final days of Jesus matched our own mood of the suffering and the violence of all the people of Gaza, the West Bank and Israel. Good Friday's Stations of the Cross on the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem's old city was the perfect spiritual fit for our own sense of loss and near despair. The day I was most wary of most dreading was Easter Day. How would we raise ourselves with hallelujahs and Easter joy when on the ground in Gaza nothing had changed? Children, women and men were still dying in their hundreds every day from missiles. Aid was still not getting through insufficient quantities to prevent extreme hunger. Hostages were still held in underground tunnels. Our hearts were breaking and the celebrations of Easter seemed a far distant cry from that reality. But when Easter Day dawned, we gained a glimpse of something to turn us around. At our service in St George's Anglican Cathedral, we gathered Palestinians and foreign nationals together and we sang our hearts out. It changed nothing in Gaza. It did not release the hostages. It did not lift the crushing restrictions in the West Bank. It did not stop bombs falling and people dying. But for a couple of hours, we proclaimed a truth which is written into nature. God has contended with the power of darkness and evil, and God has won. We sang our hearts out because we heard again the story of an empty tomb and the declaration which the angels gave to the women, he is not here, he is risen. Now we are two weeks into the season of Easter. The joy is just still there, but it's battling with the gathering darkness. Of course, it can be the same for any one of us. There are multiple reasons why the core and essence of our Christian faith is not always the dominant thought and prevailing emotion in our hearts. If you are recently bereaved, if your marriage is in trouble, if you are living with depression and any number of other reasons, then Easter joy may not be easily accessible. But the Gospels and the best teaching of our traditions remind us over and over that our faith has to be able to endure many challenges of our circumstances. It will be tested by our life experiences. Faith must hold firm in the heat of the fire. The mention of fire brings us to Jesus' parable and the flames of Hades. It is a dire warning, 
even if we do not take the parable literally, which we should not. Jesus tells the story as a graphic warning that this life is the time in which we are given the opportunity to decide how to live, which, which lights to follow, where to set our heart. Of course, we are going to keep hold of the truth of the gospel that we are saved by grace and not by works, but we are also reminded by scripture that we are known by the fruit of our actions. In the parable, the rich man has lived to enjoy the good things of life without any concern for those who are denied such pleasures. Perhaps he has decided that compassion is for losers, that people make their own good fortune, and what concern should that be to him? Lazarus positioned himself at the gate of the man who lived the high life, believing that sooner or later he would surely be moved to spare some of his excess to benefit a man with nothing. But it never happened. Jesus tells the parable to demonstrate that decisions which may make perfect good sense whilst enjoying the fine things in this life may look different from the perspective of eternity. It is certainly a story which resonates strongly for me living in Jerusalem in a time of war. I'm fairly certain that it's a story which resonates here in York today too, because a war in the Middle East is never only a concern to the people who live in the Middle East. However, I must say that there have been times in these past six months that Palestinian Christians have felt that their Christian brothers and sisters in the wealthy and comfortable parts of the world have not noticed the suffering of poor Lazarus at their gate. The feeling of neglect and the sense of rejection felt by Palestinians by the words and deeds, or the lack of words and the lack of deeds, even by Christian leaders, has left them feeling utterly abandoned. Balancing the need to condemn Hamas with the desire to support Israel, along with the desire to protect innocent victims, has usually resulted in the innocent victims feeling as if they are the ones who are left begging without reward at the rich man's gate. But I am here to tell you that Palestinians, Christians and Muslims alike, are not sitting passively waiting for the world to come to its senses. Inevitably, people are taking many different courses of action in the face of the dangers they face, and some of them are not so good and not so wise. But my experience in many different contexts across the land of Israel and Palestine is that they will not let fear and hatred rule their actions. I clearly see a determination to pull together, to strengthen the bonds of community so that none are left to suffer alone. I am continually impressed and moved by those who are literally binding up the wounded, comforting the bereaved, feeding the hungry, and visiting those who are imprisoned. They are not just sitting around waiting for the rich countries of this world to come to their senses. They are using the forces of light to contend with the darkness which threatens to engulf them. I believe with all my heart and soul that we are all called to play our part too. On Easter Day, the Anglican Christians of Jerusalem gathered together in the Cathedral Church of St George the Martyr for the high point of the whole Christian year. We may not have been all that many, 
though it was a foolish cathedral, but it felt as if being together amounted to a great deal. I'm pretty sure that I was not alone in wondering if Easter could be made to feel anything like Easter when our hearts were breaking and we were grieving and also angry. I need not have worried. The Holy Spirit moved among us. Two of our teenagers sang and encouraged us. When I am down, and oh my soul, so weary, when troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up, they sang. We received the Eucharist as a sacrament of the presence of Christ with us. And in the final hymn we sang together, in glorious harmony, in Arabic and English simultaneously, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. In singing it, at least for a while, we knew that victory over the dark domain, and Easter joy lifted our spirits. We walked blinking out into the bright Jerusalem sunshine, and the world still had not changed. But we were changed, as I hope you too were in your own Easter celebrations as we continue through this season of Easter, may we live in that resurrection light and commit to doing the deeds of the light in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all now sing the hymn in the order of service. The strife is o'er, the battle done.
if you would like to hear more from Richard talking about the current situation and answering questions, you are most welcome to stay on after the service. Um, this will be behind me in the Lady Chapel, so if you come out of the choir and make your way um, up this aisle into the Lady Chapel, you will be most welcome. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. And I'm having a complete mental blank on the rest of that prayer, so I will revert to something that's not faded from the memory banks. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you this night and evermore. Amen. Amen.